It's my honor to introduce Iowa State Professor, Vice Chairman of the Libertarian Party, eight-time legislature candidate, and 2010 Libertarian candidate for Governor of Iowa, Dr. Eric Cooper. So many folks here tonight. Boy, I don't, uh, yeah, I'm having this introduction is kind of brutal because he said already my inter uh, this isn't going to be entertaining, uh, so that's too bad. I'm going to try and make it as entertaining as I can here. I, I don't know. He, he hasn't heard it, so he doesn't know whether it's entertaining or not. So it might be entertaining. Well, <laughs> the point to tonight is I want to talk about what libertarianism is uh, for you. And I realize in an hour talk, uh, there's been much to ask uh, to convince you to be a libertarian. That's not what I'm going to try and do. But I want to explain it well enough, such that if an issue came up, you'd be able to say, oh, yeah, I know exactly how the libertarians would feel about that. So that's our goal tonight. So when we're done with any issue, you should be able to say what the libertarians would think. Okay, well, what is libertarianism? Well, let's try and uh, look at uh, politics in the United States and how we typically think of politics in the United States. Try and figure out where libertarians kind of are on the political spectrum. So typically we think of politics going... Uh, it's kind of a unidimensional scale that goes from left wing on one side, and then you got moderates kind of in the middle, and then you got right wing people uh, on this side. Uh, and then we probably are familiar with the sort of things we'd associate with left wing and right wing. So somebody who's left wing would probably be uh, more tolerant of medical marijuana, somebody right wing less tolerant. Somebody left wing might want higher taxes, probably somebody right wing would want lower taxes. Somebody left wing would be more tolerant of gay marriage, somebody right wing would be less tolerant. Uh, left wing would want more regulation of business, right wing would want less regulation of business. So that's very familiar, and I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with uh, these folks. But here's the thing, so given that that's the traditional view of philosophy, the question is, so where, where are libertarians? I mean, who, would do, uh, who are we close to? Where would we put ourselves on the scale? And that's kind of the problem. That's the problem with explaining libertarianism to people is, that we don't really fit on the scale very well, and that's why people have trouble understanding. Uh, I was, uh, when I was running for governor, I was being interviewed by this reporter in Dubuque, and she had never heard of libertarians. The only thing she had heard of about libertarians is that we were the extreme right-wing fringe of the Republican Party. We were the people who thought the Republicans were like a bunch of commies, is, is, uh, who she thought libertarians were. <laughs> And so if you ask her where are libertarians on this scale, her idea is we're out here. We're like beyond Hitler. We're like Hitler squared is what libertarians were uh, as far as she was concerned. And you can see like the fear in her eyes while she was interviewing me because she's like, she's sitting across the table from, from Hitler squared. So, okay, so that's one idea of, of what libertarians were. Now, on the other hand, in uh, 2007 and 2008, First time Ron Paul uh, ran for president, I was a uh, high mucky muck in the Ron Paul campaign. At that point, I was the campus coordinator in the campaign for all the Iowa colleges, not just Iowa State, but I coordinated all uh, Iowa college activity in the 2008 campaign. Uh, now, the guy I reported to was the state chairman for the Ron Paul campaign, and he was very conservative Republican. Uh, if we put him on this scale, he'd be somewhere here, I think, uh, on the scale, on uh, the right way. And now I know his, uh, his nickname for me, uh, behind my back, not to my face, but he would call me to other people, that crazy hippie was what he called me. He thought that I was out here. If he, uh, he had put me on the scale, he'd say I was beyond Stalin, that I was more left-wing than Stalin. Now, something's wrong here. There's no way I can be both here and here, so that's the, kind of the problem with putting libertarians on this scale. So where are libertarians? I think the problem with putting us on this scale is the unidimensional scale really doesn't capture American politics very well. And what I want to argue is really we should think of uh, political philosophy as being a two-dimensional scale. And I think uh, differences between left and right and libertarians make a lot more sense if we think of it that way. The two dimensions I want to think of uh, uh, political philosophy on are first, uh, personal freedom. That's this dimension. And it can go from low personal freedom to high personal freedom. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, somebody who wants to allow people to, say, use drugs, that would be high personal freedom. If you don't want people to be able to do that, I think there should be a law against that. That would be low personal freedom. Uh, somebody high personal freedom would like gay marriage. Uh, they'd probably be uh, in favor, opposed to the military draft. Uh, so all those things would kind of be high personal freedom. Now, on the other hand, uh, the other dimension is economic freedom. 
uh, economic freedom, say somebody was high on economic freedom, would want low regulation of business, they want in general low taxes, they want in general laissez-faire economic policies, uh, they'd probably be opposed to interference with private businesses, like things like the smoking ban, for example. So that would be people that are high on economic freedom want very little government involvement in the economy. People low on economic freedom, well, they want a lot of involvement of the government in the economy. Okay, well now I think our different philosophies make more sense. So we talked about the liberal conservative dimension, left to right before. And this is where our old axis would be that was on the last one. It would be here. And so we can now define what a liberal is. A liberal is somebody who wants a, is willing to have wants a lot of high personal freedom, but low economic freedom, wants the government to restrict economic freedom. And then a conservative is somebody who wants low personal freedom, uh, but high uh, levels of economic freedom. That's what a conservative is. But the nice thing about this new two-dimensional view is now we create some new quadrants as well. And so the quadrant we're going to talk about tonight is the libertarian quadrant. And so in general, we are people who want a lot high economic freedom, and we want high personal freedom as well. And we're going to take these a little bit further than like the modern Republican and Democratic parties do uh, when we do this. I'm going to talk about our specific positions on these issues before. So that's what a libertarian is. A libertarian takes some of the things from a conservative, some of the things from a liberal, and so that's why people tend to confuse where we are on the liberal uh, conservative scale. Uh, and then the opposite, then, of a libertarian would be the authoritarian. Rather than libertarians being beyond Stalin and Hitler, we're kind of the opposite of Stalin and Hitler. They want low freedom on both those dimensions, so that's the difference. Okay, so that's kind of the basic idea. We're going to play this out now. So why did we, how did we get up in this quadrant here? Did we just arbitrarily say, well, let's be here rather than somewhere else? Well, no, there's a philosophy behind libertarianism. And that's what I think is different between libertarianism and maybe liberal and conservatives, is we actually have like a philosophy of what the government should do. And so if you understand the philosophy, then any new issue that comes up, you could just apply our philosophy to it. And I don't think you could do that with, say, the, the Republicans and Democrats. But let's understand what the philosophy is, a libertarian philosophy that leads us to be in this quadrant here. And really, it's essentially just the philosophy of Thomas Jefferson about what the government should do. So let's talk about what Jefferson's philosophy is. What Jefferson said is that government is the institution in a society that's allowed to use force. And by force, I mean physical violence. There are some things that society needs to have done that require physical force, require violence. And so the reason why we have a government is in order to perform those activities. Now, what are the activities that require force? Well, I would say, libertarians would say, there are four activities that require force. Okay. First activity that requires force is protecting people from body crimes. Now, what I mean by body crimes are things like murder and rape and assault. So we need a government to do that. Protecting people from property crime. Now, from property crimes, the most obvious property crimes are things like theft and vandalism. But I would also include under property crimes, things like fraud, where you're like misrepresenting what you're selling to somebody. Well, that's a property crime as well, so I'd, I'd agree the government should be involved in preventing fraud. And then also pollution. Uh, pollution is a property crime because you're taking you know, this uh, pollutant and dumping it on other people's property. It's as much a property crime as if you were to take your garbage and throw it on somebody's property. Right? So pollution's a property crime as well. So we need uh, the government to protect people from property. Now, let's say there's a contract dispute. Say I've entered into a contract with somebody else. The other party thinks that uh, I've broken the contract. I think that I have conformed to the contract. We can go to the government to resolve our dispute. Uh, and then uh, whatever the government decides, well, that has to be enforced using violence. So enforcing the terms of contracts would require physical violence. And then the last category is kind of a catch-all. And that is providing public goods. Now, some of you who are in like Econ 101 probably know what public goods are. And public goods are things that the market left to its own devices uh, doesn't supply in the optimal amount for one reason or another. So let me give you some examples of some public goods. Lighthouses would be the classic example of public goods, like every Econ 101 book uses the example of a lighthouse. You can't really make money or make a profit operating a lighthouse so if the government didn't provide lighthouses, then the market itself probably wouldn't provide them. One can also argue, and some libertarians would disagree with me, that eminent domain is necessary in some cases for like laying the roads. So if you want to lay roads, you might have to give the government the power to take property from people 
such that it can lay the roads. And some libertarians would not agree, would agree that, would say that they shouldn't be able to do that. I would say that they should until we come up with an alternative. But after the roads are laid, we don't need the government to maintain the roads. Maintaining the roads can be done uh, without the government, so that doesn't require force. But this is it. These four things are the only things that require force. And so we're saying that's all the government should be doing. Now, why should we just be limited to these four things? Well, the reason is this. The government is a monopoly. And like all monopolies, it has very little incentive to please its customers. It also has very little incentive to be cost effective. What libertarians would say is when we give more and more responsibility to the government, we are giving more and more responsibility <laughs> to the least efficient institution in our society. So that's why the presumption is, because monopolies don't do things efficiently, if there's another way to do something other than the government, then it's probably best that we do it the other way, that we do it in a competitive situation, competitive market, rather than through a government monopoly. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this when I say the government should do only these four things. Well, let's say some, something like trash collection or mail delivery. Those aren't included. Those wouldn't be one of those four things. And I would say, no, the government shouldn't be doing trash collection or mail delivery. And then they say, what? So what? We should just let trash pile up in the street? Well, no, that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying, yes, there should be trash collection. Yes, there should be uh, fire protection. But there are better ways of doing that than the government. It requires a second argument to say, yeah, and the best way of providing fire protection, the best way of providing trash collection is the government. We That argument is never made. And we say there isn't a good argument for that. There are better ways of doing this. Things. So that's what we're saying. We're not saying that other things shouldn't be done beyond those four. We're just saying the government, because it's a monopoly, it needs to be limited to these four. Okay, so now here are the kind of two key principles of libertarianism that you can use to understand libertarianism if you understand the four things here. First thing is, we're going to say that it's very important that we have a limited government. What we mean by that is, government's limited to these four things, the four activities that require force, and it doesn't do anything else. Now, I would say, and there are going to be libertarians that disagree with me, I would say that the government may collect taxes to perform those four activities, but it can't collect one penny more in taxes than it needs to do those four activities. We'd say that's theft after that. The government can take tax money to perform its legitimate functions, but no tax money beyond. And then the second key concept of libertarianism is that we live in a free society, and it's important that we preserve a free society. What that means is that peaceful people, and what I mean by peaceful people are people who aren't committing body crimes, people who aren't committing property crimes, people who are uh, honoring any contracts that they've made, those people, and who are mentally adults, that is, you're, uh, you, know, you have uh, at least a 90 IQ and you're over 18. Well, you should be able to live your life as you choose. If you're not hurting anybody else, you should be able to live your life in the fashion that you like. That's what it means to live in a free society. All right, so these are the two key concepts. If you understand those, you can pretty much understand uh, where we're coming from. So, uh, the idea being, well, let me explain why we want a free society. The idea is that you're in the best uh, position to know what would make you happy. And as you're in a better position to know whether, say, smoking a joint would make you happy than the government, or whether that would improve your life. And so that's why it's best to let the individual decide how to live their lives rather than let the government decide. All right, let's go back to my little uh, table here uh, that we uh, put up before. And now I understand why we're in this quadrant up here. But here's like the cool thing and what I really love about being a libertarian. The beautiful thing is that because most people are concentrated in these two cells here, and in America almost nobody is in the authoritarian cell down there, what it means is that anybody I meet on the street, there's going to be something that I agree with them. There are lots of issues on which I agree with liberals, lots of issues uh, on which I agree with conservatives. And so I've worked with, say, I've worked with the Green Party on drug legalization issues. I've also worked with Green Party people uh, on ballot access issues. I've worked with Democrats on anti-war uh, protesting. And then I've worked, uh, I've worked with a lot of conservatives, too, like when I worked for the Ron Paul campaign, so a lot of uh, smaller government issues with conservatives. So that's what I love. Anybody I mean on the street, there's probably something we agree on and we can work together. And that's what I want libertarians to do, because we're kind of a small group. I want to, us to work with liberals and conservatives when we can to get the stuff that we want. 
Okay, uh, and then the nice thing is, like I said, there are very few people in the authoritarian quadrant down here, and so I don't have a lot of people who, who really, really dislike me. Really, only twice on campaign stops have I just had people really just hate my guts, where two times I've had two separate stops. People come up and just screaming at me and calling me every foul name you can think of and uh, pointing out each of my physical defects. And both of these men, people were members of the same group, uh, public school teachers. And so I think the only people in this quadrant in America may be, may be them, because they're the ones who will most violently disagree with us. All right, well, let's talk about some places where we agree and how much we agree uh, with different uh, political philosophies. Well, let's talk about places where we would agree with liberals. Okay? So one I've already mentioned is gay marriage. I'm going to talk about that later in the talk, uh, pretty extensively. But I also say, again, for, for a lot of these, we're going to take it further. So I don't know, want you to think that liberals and libertarians are the same on this. We would, uh, I would be for, and I think most libertarians would be for, uh, polygamous marriage as well. So like, you know, there are certain Mormons uh, in like Arizona that practice polygamous marriage, we, would, we wouldn't have a problem with that. I think if people want to enter into an agreement, an arrangement like that, they should be able to do that. Uh, liberals would probably be for medical marijuana. Uh, we would certainly, libertarians would certainly be more for medical marijuana, but again, we take it further. We're not just for medical marijuana, we're for recreational marijuana, we're for ornamental marijuana. Anything you want to do with marijuana, we're going to be okay with. Okay, so we're going to be uh, uh, the most tolerant of drug use of any political philosophy. So we'll take a little more straight. Uh, open immigration, we're in favor of that too. At least that should be the idea. Now, I'd agree if we just opened the borders tomorrow to anybody who wanted to come in, that would definitely cause problems anytime you get a huge influx of immigrants into some place really quickly. That's kind of what happened on the East Coast in the 1900s and also happened in California during the, the, the Dust Bowl. Things are really bad because it's going to be hard for them to find work. But that should be our goal. It, would, it may be gradual to, to get there. But the ideal would be for, to have open immigration where people can cross the national borders whenever they want. The reason we're for open immigration, uh, libertarians are, is the same reason we're for free markets. For everyone, when people can move to wherever they can get the best job that they can. That's why we're for open immigration. So I tell conservatives who aren't for that, hey, I'm for open immigration for the same reason I'm for free trade. The market works best when people can move to wherever their labor is worth the most, and it's good for everybody when that happens. So that's the idea. And then, uh, just like the military draft. Now, that hasn't been an issue in a long time, but in the olden days, like during Vietnam, they could force you to serve in the military. And liberals don't like that. Libertarians don't like that, too. And we also say that about national service. People should join the military uh, if they want to. Now, saying that, here's the, the obvious thing I'll get is, well, you're being impractical. What if somebody invades us and nobody wants to join the military? Well, I mean, we'll, we'll be destroyed. Well, okay, again, I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't have a military, we shouldn't induce people to join the military. Uh, what I'm saying is coercing them into joining the military is a bad idea. What we should do if we need soldiers is what we do in any other circumstance. What happens is the price of being coming a soldier should go up until supply meets demand, essentially. We should pay people enough that they want to join the military, want to become soldiers, not force them to become soldiers. That's the appropriate way. All right, so these are the things where we'd be in, in substantial agreement with liberals. We'd probably take them a little bit further. All right, but we'd also say there are some things where we agree uh, with conservatives as well, so let's talk about some of those. Okay, more than anything else, I think what defines libertarians and where uh, libertarians are going to disagree with liberals is we love markets. We think markets are very efficient ways of coordinating human activity. We want to apply markets as far as we can. And what we don't like is government policies that interfere with markets operating efficiently. We think that markets, it's best to have a laissez-faire uh, capitalist system. And we talked about, talked about earlier about how people think uh, that, that reporter in Dubuque thought that libertarians were, thought Republicans were a bunch of communists. Well, that, that kind of is true, <laughs> is the thing. That is, we're a lot more committed to real free market capitalism than, say, uh, the average Republican. Why? Well, free market capitalism, if you look at the freest countries in the world, and these are places like New Zealand and Singapore and Hong Kong in particular, those are also the places with the strongest economies. The ones with the most restricted economies uh, are the, the ones with the most government control. Those are the least healthy economies in the world. 
We think wealth is really, really good. That in fact, wealth makes everything in society better. A wealthy society is healthier and happier and smarter and more interesting and more fun. And so we want to increase the wealth in society, make the pie as big as possible. And we really don't care how equal the slices of that pie are. We want to make sure everybody gets a really, really, really big piece. We don't really care whether they're equal. Now, a lot of people think the, the free market is bad for poor people. I'm not going to spend too much time on this here, but we'd say no, that's one of the main reasons we love the free market is uh, we think free market is good for poor people. I think there is a very objective measure for how well a country is treating poor people, and that measure is what is the number of poor people trying to get into that country relative to the number who are trying to get out of that country. And if you look across the world, the places where poor people want to go are not the most restrictive economies, they're the most laissez-faire economies. That's where they want to go. Now, I get a lot of hassle about this. When I was running for governor, I was on public TV, and public TV people really don't like free markets, and so I had the sneering uh, interviewer who said, has this ever worked anywhere? Well, yeah, libertarianism has worked, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a sin that this is not better known. Hong Kong's one of the greatest success stories in the history of mankind. The end of World War II, that place was a third world hellhole. Nobody would want to live there. This place was a rock. It has no natural resources whatsoever. It has a really nice natural harbor. But that's it. And after World War II, it was as poor as any place in the world. Well, it was controlled by the British governors. And around 1960, uh, Copperthwaite, who was the British governor at the time, he was a disciple of Adam Smith uh, and believed very strongly in free market economics. And in about 1960, he said, all right, let freedom ring, baby. We're going to have the most unadulterated, laissez-faire capitalism in the history of the world. Now, at the time, uh, Britain, Great Britain was controlling uh, Hong Kong. This is 1960. At the time, the uh, average person in Hong Kong made 29% of what the average person in England made. Okay, this is 1960. 29% of what the average person in 36 years later, 1996, the span of half, half a lifetime, a okay, person in Hong Kong now makes 157% of what the average person in England makes. And that's not because they discovered huge oil reserves. That's the power of free market capitalism. Those people's lives are better. Imagine somebody in 1960 and, and their life in 1996 who lived in Hong Kong. Those people's lives are better. And so it's because of things like that, we think that the poor people of the world are best served by free market capitalism. Not because we don't care about poor people. We want free market capitalism because we do care about poor people. All right. Similarly, along the same line, we don't like taxes because they interfere with wealth creation. Uh, when you tax something, what happens is when things get produced is when the cost of producing them is less than what you can sell it, or is less than what you can sell it for. Well, those things are going to get produced. Anything that costs more to produce than somebody who's willing to buy it, well, it's not going to get produced. Well, if you add taxes on to the costs of what you're doing, well, that means there are fewer things that are going to be produced because every time you add a cost, that means there are going to be some things out there where now with this additional cost, it could no longer be profitable to make it. So I want taxes to be as low as possible because high taxes and inhibit wealth creation. And there are taxes that we like and taxes we don't want. So taxes that make the market hard to work. That would be like property taxes. Property taxes discourage people from improving their property, and so they lead to less wealth creation. So we don't like them. What we really like are sales tax, because sales tax doesn't inhibit wealth production. Uh, and then we also like, uh, like a flat income tax. The sales tax isn't enough, because there, as you produce more, you aren't penalized for producing more. Graduated income tax penalizes people for producing more and reduces wealth. So that's why we don't like that. We also think, uh, because we like markets, we don't like how education is done. Now those of you at Econ 101 know there are different types of markets, and where the market works most uh, efficiently is a purely competitive market, where it's really easy to enter the market or leave the market, like what, what you have with farms. It's not that expensive to start to start a farm, and so you know, farms are easy to start. Okay. Well, that's where the market works best, is when you have a purely competitive market, and that is what we should have for school choice. There's some arguments you can make that some money should be attached to. Uh, should, there's, there's an argument from public goods. 
that the government should be involved in providing some money to the school. Okay. The argument goes like this. Let's say somebody like me. I don't have kids who go to school, and yet I'm uh, required to pay taxes to support those. The argument is that, well, I'm getting back more in benefits than I'm paying in in taxes. The benefits I get are if people are educated, then they'll be less likely to commit crimes because they can support themselves. They'll understand how the government works. They'll make better decisions at the voting booth. So there are lots of, say, advantages that come to me, even if I don't have kids, from supporting the public <coughs> group. All right, so if we want to say that, yes, that's a public good, so a little bit of tax money should go to uh, provide for education, well, the best way of doing that is not by having a monopoly education system where you don't get any choice about where to go. The best way to do that is attach the money to the individual child and then let the child go wherever they want to go. And then we allow a free market in schools, and so people can go wherever they want to go. We get all the benefits of market competition. So one of the things libertarians dislike most is that we have a monopoly school system right now, which is the least efficient way of doing things. What we'd like to have is a non-monopoly or competitive system where people can go to different places. And then gun control. Well, for the same reason we want people to, we think people should be allowed to take drugs if they want to. We also think people should be allowed to have guns uh, if they want to. Drugs are potentially dangerous to third parties. People can take drugs and then get into a car and, and kill people. Uh, however, uh, most people who use drugs do so peacefully and they don't hurt others. And their freedom should not be restricted because there are a few irresponsible. And what we would say is similarly, it's exactly the analogous situation with individuals who own guns. A lot of people, guns is their hobby. They think it's fun. Uh, and they do it responsibly. 99% of them do. And we would say, yeah, they should be allowed to do that. Be serious penalties for anybody who commits a body crime uh, with a gun or a property crime with a gun. But no, in a free society, you have to allow people to use things, even when they're dangerous. And so when most people use these peacefully, they should be allowed to use them. So. All right, so those are the things where we agree with conservatives. Now, there are a few things where absolutely nobody agrees with us. We're all alone in the world on these things. And so let's mention some of these. So these are things that we'd say is incompatible with a free society. We talked about a free society before. The idea behind the free society was that if you're peaceful, if you're not hurting other people or their property, you ought to be able to live your life uh, as you want to. And so these things are examples of things where they're violating the free society. And that is you're required to wear a motorcycle helmet, drive a motorcycle, required to have a seatbelt uh, to uh, drive in a car. And then also pro fireworks, prostitution, and gambling are other things that, that are restricted that we really dislike. And there's nobody in either the Republican or Democratic Party who seriously wants these things set to go away. Well, now, what we would say is that uh, I get a lot of people saying when I would say you want to uh, legalize these things, well, you're not considering the costs or the social costs of these things. Uh, well, yeah, I, I think we are. And it's uh, reasonable to say to people, Okay, if you're gonna, if the activity you're going to engage in imposes some cost, you're the one who has to bear those costs. Uh, that is reasonable. But if there's two percent of people who can't handle some activity, let's say uh, gambling, for example, uh, that doesn't follow from that. That our response to that is that a hundred percent of people uh, shouldn't be allowed to do it. There are other ways to handle those costs besides restricting any of these things for absolutely everybody. Uh, I don't see any problem with requiring somebody to, say, have health insurance if they want to ride without the helmet. And if you do that without the health insurance, we won't pay for your medical care if you get in a wreck. That's perfectly fine. Same thing with seat loans. Let's say gambling. Let's say somebody has shown that they, are, they gamble so much that they no longer are able to support their children. Well, I think you can impose a penalty on them that they're no longer allowed to gamble. But what you can't do is say, well, because there are 2% of these people out there that cannot handle gambling, therefore nobody gets to do gambling, that's antithetical to a free society. That means that they shouldn't get to do gambling, not that everybody should get to Okay, and then there are some issues where libertarians disagree. Now, one that drives me up the wall is the abortion thing, because I'll try to get people to run for the Libertarian Party, and I'll get tons of them saying, and these are half of, half of them are liberals, half of them are conservatives, saying, well, I just disagree with your position on abortion, so I won't do that. So whatever our position on abortion is, everybody disagrees with us, apparently. I've always wondered, what do you think our position on abortion is? And the reality is we don't have one. If you look at the, uh, the uh, platform of the National Libertarian Party and the state platform, neither one takes a position. 
Reason is, is uh, it depends, abortion, depending on how you define it or what, why you think murder is wrong, can be considered a body crime. So if you think, some people think, that uh, the, uh, when the egg meets sperm and you have a new individual, new cell that has new DNA, new human essentially, well that thing is a human at that point and has all the rights of a human. There are other people, and so if you believe that, if you believe that that thing, uh, the, the, as soon as you get a new cell with new DNA, it's a human, well, then killing that thing would be a body crime to many uh, libertarians. It'd be like murder. Right? Other people would say, I would say probably, that no, that thing doesn't really have any moral significance because that thing, you know, there's nothing, it would not experience anything negative from being killed. There's not, it doesn't have a brain yet, doesn't have a nervous system. And without that, it's really no different than like killing your skin cells when you scratch yourself. You're not killing anything that actually cares about being killed. So if you think that, uh, say, I would say that the first time it's murder is if the thing has a part of its brain that would find being killed aversive. So that would be about 28 weeks when the thalamus develops. That's when the fetus can first experience pain, and I would say to me, that's the point at which it becomes murder. So the thing is, depending on when you think this a human has moral significance, that will determine when you think murdering that thing, killing that thing, when it constitutes a body crime. And so that's why libertarians are different. So I'd say, based on the libertarians I know, and just like the Libertarian National Convention stuff, I'd say about two-thirds libertarians are pro-choice, and say about a third are pro-life. Uh, so, somewhere around I, It might be 60-40, but certainly it's still majority pro-choice. Now, uh, other issue where libertarians differ is capital punishment. Uh, capital punishment means killing, uh, killing people who committed a crime. A lot of libertarians do not want to give the government the power to kill a person, which I can understand. They want to restrict the government's ability to do that. Now, other libertarians would say, well, it is an appropriate function of government to punish people who have committed crimes. That's why we protect people from body crimes. Well, if you commit a body crime, insult somebody, we're going to catch you and put you in jail. That's a legitimate function of government, we would say. And pretty much any penalty some, the government imposes on somebody who's committed a property crime or a body crime would be illegal if a private citizen did. So if you, the government imposes a fine on somebody, well, that would be stealing if a private citizen Right? And if the government locks somebody up in jail for committing a crime, well, that would be kidnapping if a private citizen did it. And similarly, if uh, the government kills somebody for a crime, well, that would be murder of a private citizen. So whatever the government does to punish this, it's going to be something that a private citizen wouldn't be allowed to do. And so the argument on the other side is, well, killing somebody is really not qualitatively different from throwing them in jail or fining them. It's still something kind of unique that the government is allowed to do as part of its function of preventing body crimes and problems. So that's why uh, on capital punishment, I'm pro-capital punishment. The reason I am is because I read all the scientific literature before I ran for governor, and I think there's pretty clearly is a deterrent effect of uh, capital punishment based on my reading of the literature. Seven of eight meta-analysis. Meta-analysis tries to look at all the data that anybody's collected. Seven of eight of them found a deterrent effect, and the best estimate was every person killed through capital punishment saves about eight innocent people's lives. Well, those people matter, I and mean, that's why we have the government protecting us from body crimes and property crimes. So that's why I would say if it would protect those people, then yes, you should have to use capital punishment. But lots of libertarians disagree. When I ran for governor, I specifically chose a running mate who disagreed with me on both of these, so I'm pro-choice and he was pro-life, and I'm pro-capital punishment and he's against capital punishment, just so uh, it would prove when we went on the radio, yeah, libertarians really do disagree about these two issues. So uh, if you hear somebody say, I don't agree with the libertarian position on abortion, they're an idiot, okay? They're in the libertarian position on abortion. Okay? And I, next time I, I'll, I'll call them an idiot next time I think. Okay, well, there are people that you know that are libertarians uh, here. Uh, so here are some politicians who are libertarians. Now we've got Jefferson and Cleveland, we're both Democrats. Coolidge, Goldwater, and Ron Paul uh, are both Republicans, so they're people uh, on both sides of the aisle who are, are libertarians. And then there have been tons of Nobel Prize winners in economics uh, who have been libertarians. Now, 
Now, when I, the political science department here at Iowa State does not take libertarians seriously, and then when, like, when, when I gave a, I gave a talk like this at UNI, their political science department offers like extra credit to come to the talk. Our political science department here, uh, whenever I want to speak to them, they say, no, nah, libertarians are just a bunch of nuts. You don't have to listen to what they have to say because they're just nuts. Well, now, and it's a minority uh, view, and that's what universities are for, kind of, is talk about minority views. But see these guys, uh, they all won the Nobel Prize in economics. They're all libertarians. They would agree with every single thing I'm saying here tonight. And probably the one you're most likely to have heard of is, is Milton Friedman, and I'd say that's who I'm intellectually closest to is Milton Friedman uh, in my thing. Uh, so I don't think you can dismiss a libertarianism out of hand as nutty. There are lots of really, really smart people who think uh, that is the, the way to go. Uh, and so it actually has to be intellectually engaged. I don't think you can just say, well, that they're nuts. And then there are some celebrities uh, that you've probably heard of that are libertarians. So Clint Eastwood is very outspoken libertarian. Kurt Russell and Drew Carey is, uh, you know, he's on the Price is Right, and he's come out very strongly for marijuana legalization, even recreational legalization. So it takes a lot of guts on his part. Uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, those are the South Park guys. And if you ever seen, like, the political episodes of South Park, they all are libertarian politics. I'm going to talk about one of the episodes a little bit later in the talk here. But they all highlight libertarian politics. So if you ever watch South Park and find yourself saying, yeah, damn right, while you're watching it, <laughs> well, yeah, you got a little bit of libertarian in you, those guys are libertarian. Now, Penn and Teller, Penn in particular, they're both libertarians, but Penn is a super outspoken libertarian, maybe the most outspoken libertarian. In the United States. Uh, they had a show on Showtime uh, that's not there, it's called Penn and Teller's Bullshit, is what it was called. And then about, I don't know, about a third of those shows were political shows too, and they were all libertarian politics as well. So there are a lot of people out there uh, who are, uh, in fact, libertarian. Okay, uh, well, now let me talk about, I want to talk about several issues now, a little bit more in depth. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about maybe one issue where I think liberals will agree with me. Uh, and conservatives will disagree. I want to talk about one issue where I think liberals will uh, disagree with me and conservatives will agree. And I just wanted you to see our thinking on these things, to see you know, how we came. But let's talk about uh, gay marriage and why, uh, in general, we're for gay marriage. Uh, I'll tell you the story. I was, uh, when I was running for governor, there's a conservative breakfast group that meets in town, and they like invite political candidates to come talk to them. Uh, and this was right before the Republican primary. Uh, they had invited, and this is the Ames Conservative Breakfast Club, they invited Bob Vanderplotz, who was uh, running for, for governor uh, in the primaries, and Rod Roberts, who was running for governor. They also invited Terry Branstead, but he didn't show up. And then they invited me uh, to, to talk and address the group. And uh, the guy who was in charge of the group, his name was Andy, uh, he told me, I asked him what the format was, and he said, well, you've already given a speech to this group before, which I had, uh, but Rod Roberts was one of the candidates he hadn't. So they told me, we're going to let Rod Roberts speak for five minutes because he's never addressed the group. And then after he's done, we're just going to have the three of you answer questions. That's what's going to happen. So I didn't prepare a speech or anything because I didn't, I didn't think I was going to get to speak, uh, how they describe it. All right, well, when I get there, the guy who told me the format, he was sick and he didn't show up. So somebody else decided they were going to be in charge of this. And they decided, rather than just answer, you know, not have a speech and answer questions, they decided each of us was going to give a speech. So I was scared to death because I hadn't prepared a speech and I didn't know what was going to happen. Well, I fortunately was going to speak third. So Rod Roberts came up and he gave a speech first. And most of his speech was about how much he hated gay marriage. And so he talked a lot about that. And right after that, Bob Vanderplatz got up. And I know he was, he was the main guy behind the retention vote for the judges when the judges got out and, you know, voted out because they voted for gay marriage. Well, he said, no, I'm the one who hates gay marriage the most. Nobody hates gay marriage more than I do. Well, uh, I didn't know what to talk about. They, those guys both talked about that, and uh, I didn't have anything to talk about, so I said, okay, I guess I can talk about that too. So uh, here's what I said to them on the spur of the moment. This, thing. this is a group of conservatives now, so they were a hostile crowd. I said, uh, you know who the Pilgrims were? The Pilgrims were a group of people who lived in England, and everybody in England hated their guts. And they came to America because they wanted to live the way that they thought best without being hassled. And to me, that's the most American story there is, the pilgrims. If somebody from another country asked me, is America an exceptional place? I'd say, yes. 
It's a very exceptional play. And if they ask me why, I would say because it's the first place that was founded on freedom. It was the first place that was founded on the idea that you're in the best position to decide what would make you happy in life. And the idea of America, the idea why the pilgrims came here, was that even if everybody else in society hates your guts, as long as you're being peaceful, as long as you're not hurting other people or their property, the government will protect you from them. <coughs> that is, you're allowed as a peaceful person to live the life the way you want, even if the surrounding society hates your guts. And this is the first place that was like that. Well, you know, gay people are the pilgrims. They're a group of people who the surrounding society doesn't like very much, and I think they just want to live their lives in a way that's going to make them happiest without being bothered by other people. And I think in America, that's what you let people do. Now, I've had a lot of people come up and say, well, now, shouldn't the people of Iowa get to vote on what gay marriage is? Shouldn't it be the people of Iowa who decide what constitutes marriage in the state of Iowa? And what I said was, well, yeah, we could totally do that. In our government system, we have a system set up for amending both the Iowa Constitution and the U.S. Constitution, where we could define marriage as being heterosexual marriage uh, if we wanted to do that. In fact, given our system of government, if you have a sufficiently big supermajority, you can vote to do anything you want to any minority group that you want to do it to. I mean, we could all vote to persecute the pilgrims if we wanted to do that. Well, why would we ever do that? I can't imagine anything more antithetical to the central philosophy of the United States. In America, you can live the way you want if you're being peaceful without being hassled. That's not America. That's England. Well, I think that sums up the libertarian philosophy pretty well in general. That is, peaceful people need to be left alone. Okay. Now, a similar token, let's talk about one that I think uh, conservatives will agree with me and the liberals will, and that's the smoking ban. Now, this is one of the things that libertarians hate most is the smoking ban. And let me try to explain why. What I want to explain is how maybe the market solves problems okay, and how the government solves problems and the difference between the two. Let's take like what types of restaurants we have in Ames. That's determined by the market. Right? So if you look around at the types of restaurants we have, there's tons of pizza places, there's tons of hamburger places, there's fewer seafood places, but there's some, and there's fewer Greek places, but there's some. But, beautiful thing is, uh, you know, the market is allocated. So, there are lots of pizza and hamburger places, because lots of people like pizza and hamburgers. There are fewer people, minority of people, like Greek food and seafood. But the beautiful thing is, even if you're in the minority, there are some places where you can go, and the majority of the places you can go, and everybody gets what they want, and everybody's pretty happy. Now, similarly, before the smoking ban, uh, there, when the market allocated what the smoking rules were for the restaurants in Ames. So this is according to the Ames Tribune. This is before the local smoking ban or the state smoking ban. 65% of the restaurants in Ames did not allow smoking prior to the ban, and 35% did. That is, the market allocated the smoking rules in the restaurants. Most people wanted to go to a restaurant where there wasn't smoke, so most restaurants catered to that. But there was a minority of people who wanted to be able to smoke uh, while they went to the restaurant. And so there were some restaurants for them as well. And so everybody had a place they could go, and everybody was pretty happy. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about a market. But now the government decides to get involved. Because the majority does not like smoking, the government passes a law saying, well, majority rule, no restaurant can have smoke. Now the majority get what's it wants, and the minority gets nothing. Huh? Alexis de Tocqueville was a French philosopher who came to the United States in the early 19th century, 1800s. Uh, if you took uh, Western Civ, you might have uh, read Democracy in America, which is the book he wrote. What he said in Democracy in America was, the one thing Americans have to worry about with their form of government is the tyranny of the majority. That is, the government, the majority could use the government to impose what it likes on peaceful people who aren't hurting anybody else. 
And this is a prime example of smoking ban of what the Tocqueville was talking about. Here, people gather on private property, uh, voluntarily. They're not bothering anybody off that property. And so, in a free society, they should be allowed to, to smoke and, and eat there. And if they're not allowed that, that's, that's clearly tyranny of the majority. Now, what I get when I say this, a lot of people say, well, they, you know, there are people who work at, at these restaurants. And they're going to be exposed to the smoke like all day and their health risks associated with that. So we have to ban the smoking in the restaurants to protect the employees who are going to be around them. Well, uh, that is true. I would say you're right. There, there's going to be some health risks uh, that the employees are exposed to from being around that smoke hole. Uh, and in fact, if we look at other jobs, there are plenty of jobs where there are health risks uh, associated with it. Uh, farm work is very dangerous. Um, uh, construction work is very dangerous. Lots of forms of manufacturing work are dangerous. There are many people who have to drive as part of their jobs, and driving is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. So lots of people have dangerous jobs. And the reason why they take these dangerous jobs is because they perceive that the benefits of taking the job outweigh the costs, including the health costs of taking the job. And they may very well be right about that. In a free society, people get to make that trade-off. They can say, yes, I'm willing to allow some risk for this reward. Well, by a similar token, there may be some reasons why people who work in a restaurant might want uh, to work in a restaurant that allows smoking. Maybe because they like the clientele better or they get better tips. But probably the most likely reason is because they themselves smoke and they'd be more comfortable in a restaurant that allows smoking. They have, or should have, exactly the same right to make the trade off between the risks of a job and the benefits of a job that everybody else has. That's part of a free society. If you don't like smoke in that work area, you go find a job somewhere else. That, that, that's what you do in free society. Okay, now when I was, uh, uh, I was invited to like the very first free speech day that Iowa State had, they have free speech day every year. And I was invited once. And in free speech day, they give you a topic that you're supposed to talk about. They wanted me to talk about libertarianism. And they like literally give you like a soap box to stand on. And then you give your speech and everybody around you is supposed to heckle you. Uh, is what, what goes on. So you all are being nice, but here they're supposed to have this. Okay, and so I was uh, given a, a speech against the, the smoking ban. There was this guy from the Green Party there who had been heckling me the whole time. And what he says is, what's the difference between smoking around somebody in a restaurant and coming by and punching them in the nose? And that's what he said. Okay, and what I said to him was, uh, you know, there is no difference at all between those two things. Uh, if somebody wanted to open a restaurant, and they put a big sign outside that said, at this restaurant, every 10 minutes, somebody's going to come around and punch you in the nose. And when you go in, the waiter tells you, now you realize, at this restaurant, every 10 minutes, somebody comes around and punches you in the nose. And you say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Sign me up. Well, no, I don't see that the government should be involved in that. That is, you made a choice to go to that restaurant. You knew what you were getting into. You wanted to do it. That's A-OK. -okay. And by a similar token, if a restaurant puts a big sign up that says, there is smoking allowed in this restaurant, and when you go in, they say, you realize if you come here, there's going to be smoking allowed, and you say you want to do it, you should be allowed to do that. And if you say you don't want to do it, you should say, well, that doesn't sound good to me, so I'm not going to go here. What you should not do is get the legislature to make sure that nobody else can go there either, which is what we have right now. Now, I think the most libertarian 30 seconds in television history came on a South Park episode uh, one time. And I'm, I'm, this takes a lot of guts, what I'm about to do, if you got to give me some credit here. So the South Park episode is called Butt Out. And, and what had happened is uh, Rob Reiner had come to Colorado, he'd come to South Park, and he wanted to get smoking banned in the bars uh, in Colorado. And as part of this, he took the South Park kids uh, to this uh, cigarette factory. And when they went to the cigarette factory, the cigarette workers were, they were like you know, making the cigarettes. And I think it's supposed to be like, kind of like the Oompa Loompas in uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Because while they went around the, making the cigarettes, they were singing this song the whole time. And so I'll, uh, I'm going to try and reproduce the song for you. So this is what requires some, uh, some guts on my part. Uh, but this is like the most libertarian 30 seconds of television history, I think, and kind of encapsulate what we think in a nutshell. Here. So here's the song they were singing. With a hidey lighty lighty and a hidey lighty lay, we work and we make cigarettes all hidey lighty day. So people get a breaky from their stressful lighty lives and relaxy with the cigarettes we make all day and night. I like to have a cigarette every now and then. 
It helps me to relax when my day is at an end. And if it gives me cancer when I'm 80, I don't care. Who the hell wants to be 90 anyway? All right, and that's it, right? That's the end. <laughs> Yes, there are some risks out there. Yes, there are some trade-offs in hell, but there can be some gains in happiness that outweigh those risks, and it can be rational to take a health risk in order to get happiness, and people should be allowed to do that. All right, well, let me conclude real quick. If I had to come up with one phrase to help you remember what libertarianism is, that one phrase would be anything that's peaceful. I love that phrase, because what we're saying is, you should be able to do anything you want, and people should be able to do anything they want, as long as they're not hurting others. So what we'd say is, don't hurt other people, don't hurt their property, honor any contracts you make, and other than that, get as much happiness for yourself as in your life as you can. You're in the best position to decide what would make you happy, you're in the best position to decide the trade-off between risk and reward, and in a free society, people should be able to make that decision. Now, I, end all, I ended my campaign talks the same way, and I had a lot of fans who came around, they always like to hear the ending. So I'll end it that way now, too, this, this speech. Uh, um, when I'm on the campaign trip, my favorite question to be asked was always, what can we do to keep, to keep young people in Iowa? And here's what I'd always say. I'd say, you know, once upon a time, Iowa had the greatest immigration slogan in the history of the world. It was a word-of-mouth campaign that took place in the beer halls of Bavaria and Munich. And it went like this. It's about 1850, 1860 when this occurred. It went like this. They said, Have you heard about Iowa? It's in America. They don't care where you're from. They don't care what language you speak. You get to keep 96% of what you earn. 4% taxes. And you get to live your life however you want. And when people heard about this, they said, oh my God, that sounds so great. That's exactly what I want. And they came here. They came here in droves. And when they came here, they put the motto of our state on our flag because they wanted to remind us, the future citizens, of why they came here, of what induced them to come here in the first place. Citizens of Iowa. You know those words, the motto of our state? Speak them with me now. Our liberties we prize, and our rights we will maintain. That's right, our liberties we prize, and our rights we will maintain. They put it right on the flag to remind us the liberty that they gave me. And I know there are some people in this room tonight who have not forgotten that. Thank you very much.